Check, 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 check. Welcome back to the Backlot 605 Podcast. My name is Casey. I am your host, and we are on episode 28 this week. And you know what? We're doing things a little bit different this week. I am actually flying solo. Um, we had a couple things come up with, with Brian and Chris and all our other uh, members that we have. So we had to deal with a, a lot of things this weekend. Brian was off in Iowa doing his thing in Iowa, whatever you do down there. I don't know. I'm from Iowa. There's not a whole lot to do. Um, we had the fight with the Game of Thrones series finale because we record on Sundays and we also had a fight with the Money in the Bank um, pay-per-view for WWE. So we're just kind of battling a lot of things. So I thought I'd just fly solo this week, uh, make sure we always have an episode out for you guys because we did miss a few weeks ago because of uh, us moving to a new studio. So without uh, going any uh, further into that, we'll jump into what we usually do this week. We are going to talk about the box office, the news, and for the main topic this week, we originally planned to do another Sophie's Choice episode, which I really enjoyed the first time. I think a lot of you listeners did as well. We will get back to that at some point, but I I want three people there at least, you know, just to break tiebreakers and just to have overall more discussion on, you know, which movie you would keep during Sophie's Choice. So that will be coming soon. We will do another one of those very shortly. But without uh, further ado, let's jump into the box office for this week. And we finally get the film that has topped Avengers Endgame for the number one spot. That movie is the Keanu Reeves-led John Wick Chapter 3 Parabellum, pulling in $57 million, coming in way above expectations, actually. And this is the first movie, as I said, that has topped Avengers Endgame at the box office. Our predictions from a few weeks ago were way off. I mean, I think Logan, our host of Anime Anatomy, he ble- I believe he said John Wick was going to call it, so congrats, Logan, that you... Uh, predicted the right film to top Endgame, and yeah, I, I was expecting all the way till Godzilla, King of Monsters, but maybe Aladdin, but yeah, I'm surprised John Wick 3 took the top spot this week. I'm glad it did, because I love this franchise. I've yet to see the third one. Might be planning to see it here this coming week, you know, just to finish off that trilogy that I love so much, but yeah, $57 million in its opening weekend. Avengers Endgame, number two. $29.4 million, bringing its total domestic gross to $770 million. It is now worldwide right around $100 million away from topping Avatar as the highest grossing film of all time. And with this movie only being four weeks out, it has at least another four to six weeks in the main theaters. So this movie will become the number one movie of all time at the domestic and uh and worldwide box office for sure. Number three, Pokemon Detective Pikachu sticking around and pulling in an impressive $24.8 million in its second week out, bringing its total gross domestically to $94 million. But overseas, this movie is making bank. Pokemon is a worldwide phenomenon. And uh, with that being said, you know, this, this means we are going to get more Pokemon movies. This movie is making money over here and overseas where honestly that's where it's going to count overseas markets and we do have a a review for pokemon detective pikachu by one of our contributing writers andy erickson that is up on backlot605.com right now check out his review there he overall enjoyed the movie i still want to see it i'm still skeptical about you know the the ryan reynolds voice um the casting of justice smith I've heard from a lot of I've heard from a lot of people that that's kind of their main problems as well, so I'm not alone. But the Pokemon is something I want to see on the big screen, so I definitely will check it out eventually. Number four this week, A Dog's Journey, which is a sequel to A Dog's Purpose, pulling in eight million dollars in its first week out. The Dennis Quaid, Josh Gad movie. Um, yeah, I saw the first one. What wasn't my cup of tea? We'll put it that way. It was a, a very melodramatic, cheesy talking dog movie. I, I don't need that. It, granted, they did one thing I didn't I, that I, I don't like in a lot of other movies. They don't make the uh, dog's mouth move in a very cheesy CGI fashion. It's all internal dialogue. But still, I don't need to see a dog talking, you know. Uh, but yeah, that pulled in $8 million. Uh, not too bad for an opening weekend against uh, a movie like John Wick and The Avengers. 
And rounding off our top five, the Rebel Wilson, Anne Hathaway comedy, The Hustle, sticking around the top five its second week out, pulling in $6 million. So that was the box office for the week. Um, we'll keep you updated on the Avengers Endgame getting closer and closer each week to topping Avatar, so we'll keep you updated on that every single week. But now, let's jump to the news. And one of the first news articles that I came across this week is something very surprising to me. Um, that is, Chris Rock is going to team up with Lionsgate to produce, and I, I don't know what other capacity he's going to be involved with, but a new Saw movie. So a new Saw movie is coming from Chris Rock, the comedian that you uh, all know and love from SNL and countless other movies, Madagascar, kids movies. Like This guy is not known for horror at all. Granted, neither was Jordan Peele, but I'm excited to see where this can go. Um, the, you know, I think this is a, uh, a bold strategy, that's for sure. Um, Rock will be executive producing the film, and it is set, it's set for a release date already. We're going to get it in October 23, 2020, so next October, that's going to be exciting because, heck, we, we haven't had a franchise that comes out every October. You know, Paranormal, or Saw did, Saw did it first, then Paranormal Activity, now we're kind of just stuck in this hiatus, like... I like having at least some cheesy horror movie to come out every October. You know what's going to be there. You know, every year you could have gone and saw a Saw movie. Every October. So I, I, I'm excited to see Saw back in that October spot. And I'm excited to see what Chris Rock can do from what I see on here. You know, he said in the interview he's he's been a fan of Saw since the uh, first couple films. And he's excited to take it in a new, dark, and twisted place. And you know what? I can... I can see it from Chris Rock. Let him do it. You know, a lot of people make jokes like, oh, if Chris Rock does it, what's Adam Sandler going to take on? That's, you know, it's a completely different story. Like, Sandler and all the other comedians that Rock is, has been a part of do their own thing, but let him be a creative force. You know, he he's he does that. Um, he came out that, with a fantastic film a few years ago, Top 5. So give him, give him a chance with this and, you know, the internet's going to be sparked about anything that comes up. So I, I'm all for it. Let this movie happen. And I want to see what Chris Rock can do and bring to the Saw franchise. Another piece of horror news this week is the Tom Holland, not Spider-Man Tom Holland, but the director Tom Holland, who is most known for Child's Play and the original Fright Night, is directing a new horror film called Rock, Paper, Scissors. Now, this movie is written by the original uh, screenwriter of Friday the 13th, the original film, Victor Miller. And this movie is basically about a man who moves back into his family home after he was uh, released from a, an asylum for the criminally insane where he used to play rock, paper, scissors with his captive um, women only to then murder them. I guess is the best way to describe it. I don't know. I just watched this trailer before we started recording. Um, I, I was sold at first just seeing, hey, it's Tom Holland, who I love as a director, teaming up with the original screenwriter for Friday the 13th. And uh, this trailer, it, it doesn't sell me, but I think I'll still see the movie because I'm excited to see, again, the Tom Holland's directing with that screenwriter. I hope there is maybe some sort of, like, Friday the 13th, the original, like, a twist where it's, you know, not what we expected. We didn't expect Pamela Voorhees to be the killer in that one. So maybe we'll get something like that. But overall, just watching this trailer for the first time, I thought it was a little cheesy, um, a little unnecessary. I think it was a... It came out... It, it looks like this movie should have came out in the mid-2000s when they were doing torture porn movies. It looks like it fits more in the the hostile collector type of era than it does now. But I, I'm all right going back to that every once in a while. You know, we got overblown with that in the early to mid-2000s. Now we're just overblown with possession and exorcism movies. So I'm, I, I like a fresh take on past ideas. That's what you have to do in the horror genre. So I will st still see this movie. Um, it is coming straight to VOD and DVD in July, I believe July 23rd, yes. So I will still check it out in some capacity, but 
I, this trailer didn't sell me on it. Maybe if they release another trailer coming up, who knows, but you, they had me on the name Tom Holland, so. That is the uh, Tom Holland directed Rock, Paper, Scissors coming July 23rd. A new trailer we also got this week was the second full trailer for Ari Aster's Midsummer, And um, I, I enjoyed the first trailer. I was sold then. Um, I should have probably stopped because I just... I'm going to go watch this movie no matter what. So, the uh, His follow-up to Hereditary and... I gotta say, this is a much different film than that. This is very bright, filled with colors. There is almost no nighttime scenes at all in this and... I'm excited to see where that can go, because when you think of horror movies, you think of the dark. You think of nighttime. You think of, you know, kids out in the woods, hiding at night behind the trees. And this movie is not that. They're out in open fields, in the summer, in the bright blue skies. And I'm excited to see where they can bring the horror within that. Because I haven't seen a movie where they use light and brightness to bring horror, but... If anyone's going to do it, I, I trust Ari Aster. I love Hereditary. It was my favorite movie of last year. And I'm excited to see where this can go. Um, I enjoy all the cast. And yeah, with without spoiling anything that's going to happen in the movie, if you're not sold, check out the second trailer and uh, let me know your thoughts. In a movie that uh, I'm not too certain about, uh, to say the least, is another trailer that we got uh, just this past week. Is for a movie called Clown Nado. Now, in the vein of Shark Nado, this movie brings killer, torturous clowns to a small city um, via tornado. So they travel by tornado, only um, to be dropped off and then terrorize the town, and that's how they travel. Yeah, um, I don't know what to think of this. Um, it is com- coming from Wild Eye Releasing, which is not. Not always known for delivering the best films, but you know what? It looks like a cheesy fun time, and that's about that's about all I can say about it. This movie looks like a cheesy fun, you know, grab a bunch of friends, sit around, drink some beers, crack some jokes at the movie, and just make fun of Clown Nato. And I think that's where, uh, where Wild Eye releasing knows where their market is, is in those type of movies, so... In that respect, I do want to see it. Um, the movie is directed by Todd Sheets. Um, I saw an interview with him here. Um, he has compared this movie to uh, films such as Evil Dead, Dead Alive, and The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Um, just from the, judging by the trailer, it is none of those. But I, I like that you're pushing your film there, dude. I, I do like that. But I'm, I'm excited to watch it because it looks like a cheesy, fun, stupid time. At all, and... It also stars Linnea Quigley. If you don't know who Linnea Quigley is, she is an 80s scream queen, uh, Return of the Living Dead, Night of the Demons, and if you've seen those movies, you know she's the best part. So I'm excited to watch it, and uh, I think it'll be a cheesy, fun time, especially if you drink a few uh, few ferns and, ferns and uh, lion paw while you're at it. So yeah, that uh, is Clown Nato coming soon. I believe it just says coming soon this summer, so... Be on the lookout for that. Uh, you're going to sit around with your friends and make fun of uh, clowns coming out of tornadoes. Also announced this week that finally the James Wan produced Mortal Kombat movie is finally moving forward. The film has a an official release date, which is a good, good indication that this movie is actually going to happen. James Wan's Mortal Kombat movie is scheduled for March 5th, 2021. Juan will be producing the film, and it will be directed by Simon McQuoid, who, um, looking at his IMDb page, has no credits except for Mortal Kombat, but he has done uh, commercial work before, so that's a little uh, a little scary, but maybe J- I trust James. Maybe he has seen this guy's work and knows what this guy can do, and, you know, there hasn't been much said about you know, what the storyline will be or what what James is going to be on besides producing. You know, is he going to be helping out with the script? Who knows? But uh, pre, pre-production is starting this month and they're going to start shooting later this year. It looks like in Africa or Africa, Australia. And yeah, so I don't know what to think of this. I'm still excited. I want to see a Mortal Kombat movie from James. But I'm, I'm a little weary of having a director with no previous film work. 
But maybe James sees something that that no one else saw in this guy. And, you know, we can hope for the best. And I think a Mortal Kombat movie done the right way with the right characters, the right actors, the right production team behind it could be something awesome. I, I still stand by that the... Granted, I haven't seen Detective Pikachu. But I still stand by the fact that the original Mortal Kombat is the greatest video game movie of all time. That's not saying much because there isn't much competition in that uh, subgenre. But I think a, an actual up-to-date Mortal Kombat movie could do awesome at the box office and actually provide a uh, decent story for fans to go and check out and watch. Also, uh, we got a new film announcement from Disney. And this one's a little bit of a out-of-the-box selection. Akiva Schaefer, who is most known for his work within the Lonely Island trio with uh, Jorma Tacon and Andy Samberg, is going to direct a live-action slash CGI movie of Chippendale Rescue Rangers. Now, this is, you know, if you have seen the Chippendale Rescue Rangers TV show um, back in the, I believe, like early 90s it started, and yeah, that's... Not the guy you would expect to do this movie, but from what I have heard, it's going to be more of a meta type of movie. More, I guess, more of like Who Framed Roger Rabbit, more than it would be a straight up adaptation of that television show. But it looks like it will be, like I said, a live action CGI hybrid between the two, and the two chipmunk duos of Chip and Dale will be uh, the CGI characters within the real world, and all I hope is that Andy Samberg at least voices one of them, and maybe Jorma uh, voices the other. Make it happen. I think that would help out this movie a little bit. And, yeah, I don't know. How do you guys feel about a Chippendale Rescue Rangers directed by uh, Lonely Island's Akiva Schaefer? Granted, he has done some great stuff. I do love his work. Um, he uh, co-directed Pop Star Never, Never Stop Never Stopping. And <laughs> I love that movie if you haven't watched it. It is, this is Spinal Tap for the new generation. It is endlessly rewatchable and a perfect spin on the pop music genre of today. He also directed one of my favorite, I guess, guilty pleasure slash underrated comedies. Back with young Andy Samberg. I believe this was in 08, so right when the Lonely Island shorts were starting to come out. And that movie is Hot Rod. If you haven't seen Hot Rod, it's, it's not a great movie. But I, but as I have said in in you know previous uh, reviews or podcasts, comedies, a big part of it for me is the quotability factor, as I like to call it. And this movie has it nonstop. It is nonstop laughs, and it is a movie you can put on anytime, sit down, watch, and absolutely love. It also has the greatest Footloose parody scene in it of all time. So. Yeah, Akiva Schaefer, he's going to direct the Chippendale live-action uh, Rescue Rangers movie. What are your thoughts on that? I don't know. I know some of the people out there, they don't like The Lonely Island. I understand that, but I think he's a good director, and I'm, I'm interested to see where this can go. And now for the, B, the uh, big news for the week, the one that has everybody up in arms up until Game of Thrones came out. Robert Pattinson is eyed to play The Batman in Matt Reeves' The Batman film. And most people, you might know uh, Pattinson from the Twilight films, unfortunately, but I gotta say, um, that is that is what I know him from. I, I am shamefully have to say I have not seen any of his other work, which I know he has done much better work since Twilight, including, you know, Good Time from last year. I just hear amazing things. And... You know, I think this is pretty decent casting, actually. Like, I th I know this guy, he can do better than Twilight, because I've seen Kristen Stewart after Twilight. She's done much better work than that. I would say, I mean, Taylor Lautner kind of is stuck in that Twilight phase. The other two, Pattinson and Kristen Stewart, have completely broken out of it. And, you know, I'm excited to see him in uh, this year's The Lighthouse coming out later this year. It, I believe, just came out at Cannes, and to a like, standing ovation, that was the movie everybody's talking about, and so I think this is the right guy for this role. And you know what? If, even if I haven't seen him in other movies, Matt Reeves is a director I trust. Um, the Planet of the Apes movies that he directed, Dawn and War, 
I think are just marvelous movies. And if he can take that type of storytelling and apply it to Batman, I think that is one perfect casting and then a perfect director to go along with that. So I'm excited to see where it goes. Um, this is also just rumored speculation right now that Robert Pattinson has been cast. I've also seen the name Nicholas Holt thrown out there in a few reports. That one I would be a little less excited about because I'm like, he's done the superhero thing. He's been Beast in the X-Men movies. I want to see someone else take on this role. And for me, I couldn't really think of an actor to take take it on. But I've heard, you know, fan castings for Robert Pattinson for a while. So I say, why not give this guy a chance and uh, bring a fresh take to Batman? Um, the only thing I don't like about some of this news that's come out is it's been rumored that the Penguin and Catwoman will be the villains in this one. So I'm like, are they just trying to remake Batman Returns from Tim Burton? Like, I, I want to see some new and fresh villains or villains we have had get their proper due. I would love to see an actual dark take on, like, the Riddler. I think that would be a very interesting give Give someone a very strong uh, role to play with and uh, bring almost like a Heath Ledger type of character, but his own spin to the Riddler. Like, do what Heath Ledger did for the Joker, but what someone can do for the Riddler. Stick within the confines of that character and make him actually menacing and scary. Um, another one I like to throw out that I, I think we just need in live action form in much better capacity than we got in Batman and Robin is Poison Ivy. Now, Poison Ivy could be a great character. Um, I want to see her in live action form at some point, maybe even in the Harley Quinn movies that they're working on. I would. You know, I'd like to see her as the villain, maybe those two teaming up. They've done it in the comics, I just want to see it in live action form. What I hope Matt Reeves does is take this in a, uh, I guess, in a completely different spin than Nolan did. I want to go a little bit more fantastical. I want to see the actual comic book villains we never could have got in, in Nolan's trilogy. I want to see people like Clayface or King Shark and Killer Croc. I want all these characters to show up. I don't need Joker again or Scarecrow. Give us someone different. I want to eventually... I would love to see the Red Hood storyline play out in some form in live action. I know we've... I think they've briefly touched on it in um, uh, Batman vs. Superman. They mention it, but they never did anything with it. I think they also mention it on the Titans show. But I want to see a full-fledged live action Red Hood in, in the film capacity. And... That, that's that's the storyline I think we could go eventually with these Matt Reeves films. But I am excited to see where this can go. I, I want it to stand alone. I don't need it to be part of this DC Extended Universe. If you want to connect it to the Joker movie that's coming out later this year, that one I'm fine with. But in, in all relative terms, I think this just needs to stand alone and be its own thing. And what do you guys think of the Robert Pattinson casting? Have you only seen him in Twilight? And that's what you're... Uh, basing your, your judgment on, I, I granted that's what I am, but I know he can do better than that because I've people I trust have told me he's much better than, than the Twilight films. So I'm excited for this casting. More, I, I'm excited for the movie and the director. So that should be coming out, I believe, in 2021, I think it's coming out. So I'm excited to see it once it comes out. So that was the news for the week. Uh, a lot of, A lot of news to cover. Uh, what was your most exciting news for the week? Let me know. Uh, for me, I like the I like the announcement of Chris Rock as the uh, producer of a new Saw series. I think that'll be very interesting, taking on that Jordan Peele style, and uh, I th I'm excited to see what Rock can bring to that franchise. So uh, instead of doing a I guess a main topic that we have done, you know. Um, I thought it would be, you know, since it is a one-man show today, doing it on my own by the the seat of my pants. I'm just flying with whatever I can think of off the top of my head here. And I thought I, I'd just talk about a few movies that I've seen recently, um, give, you know, quick reviews on them. I, I won't have time to write reviews of everything I see on Backlot605.com. But I just want to touch on some of them. Eventually, I will do, you know, longer reviews of some of these movies and... Yeah, one of the first movies I saw was Hellraiser 3 in the past week. And this one I hadn't watched yet. These are all first-time watches, except the last one I'll talk about, just because I want to talk about it. 
But Hellraiser 3 is a first time watch for me. Did watch this on on Shutter and I've seen the first two Hellraiser movies. Um for me, I don't remember a whole lot of at least the second one. The first one I do remember um the man like reforming himself and it's gross and I don't know. I I enjoyed most of Hellraiser 1. Hellraiser 2, as I said, is kind of forgettable. But Hellraiser 3 stands out to me as, as the best of the three so far. I, I decided to watch it because I heard, you know, we talked about it last week that we are getting another Hellraiser movie. And I'm excited for that, so I figured, eh, we'll, we'll finish off the trilogy at least. Maybe I'll go watch those uh, random sequels that came out after, who knows. But yeah, Hellraiser 3, I think it's an interesting movie. It finally puts Pinhead front and center as the villain. The first two movies kind of bounce around that. There's always someone else as kind of the main villain, but Pinhead always shows up at the end. And I'm excited to see more from this franchise. I I enjoyed you know Doug Bradley as Pinhead and all the other uh, Cenobite creations that come out of this movie. Um, I don't think they did this in the in the previous ones. It's I guess it's been about a year or two since I've watched the first couple Hellraiser movies, but I don't remember Pinhead turning any of the, any, uh, you know, quote-unquote normal human beings into Cenobites. Has that happened before? I'm not sure. I, I don't remember, but I, I enjoyed that when it happened in, in this movie. We get the uh, infamous CD head uh, Cenobite who throws CDs to kill people. I think that's awesome. It's a little cheesy, but you know what? You have to be with these movies, um, especially once you get to the third film in the franchise. And then uh, my favorite of the Cenobites so far, even more than Pinhead, I like the uh, cameraman Cenobite who, whose head turns into a uh, 1980s video camera. I think that's awesome, and we need more stuff like that once we get our new Hellraiser movie. Uh, another movie I watched is a movie called Chud. Now, uh, I first came across this movie because of Jordan Peele's Us this is one of the uh, movies that's sitting on the shelf at the beginning of that movie. It's one of his, I guess, inspirations for Us. And this movie is completely different than Us, but has a very similar storyline. Chud stands for Cannibalistic Humanoid Underground Dweller. And if you've seen Us, it's a similar premise. Take out, I guess, the, the cannibalistic part. But it is about humans living underground and then coming up and, and rising against the people up top. And that's that's basically what Us was about. And I think there was, for this movie being a uh, kind of cheesy 80s movie, I think there was, you know, some things that could be taken away from it. And I know Jordan Peele obviously did. We get a movie like Us, which I think is a fantastic movie, a great study of society. And Chud takes those same storylines, except just does it in a cheesy, awesome fashion. We get to see John Hurd and Daniel Stern team up years before they did Home Alone together. So I thought that was a just a, a fun little nod to see those two running around the sewers together. And I guess it's not a nod since they weren't in Home Alone together yet. But it's fun to see those two uh, actors together before uh, probably their, one of their most famous roles, at least for people of my age in Home Alone. But yeah, if you haven't seen Chud, I would highly recommend it. It's a lot of fun. It's you get to see some awesome, fun character effects, creature effects, and uh, there is a sequel. I'll I I'll probably have to watch it at some point. And yeah, it's just a fun movie. I, I like John Hurd in his uh, main role here, and Daniel Stern. He Daniel Stern I, for me is one of the most underrated actors out there. I think he is absolutely hilarious. Um, I also think he can pull off just some creepy, weird roles, too. So give us more Daniel Stern, Hollywood. Bring him back. We want more Daniel Stern. And then the uh, last new film that I watched, I watched all these on Shudder, actually. So if you haven't subscribed to Shudder, definitely check out Shudder. It's worth, I pay five bucks a month for it. It is the horror equivalent of Netflix. If you're, you know, a horror fan like me and you're just streaming through Netflix and just looking for something to watch and you go through the horror section and it's all these bad movies from the last 10 years that no one's ever heard of and you don't want to watch those, get on Shudder, five bucks a month. Why not? Because it is 100% worth your $5 a month. And yeah, it's, it's my go-to Netflix. I'll watch their Netflix original stuff, but as far as older films and classics that you have to watch, Shudder has them all. 
That's where I've caught up on all the uh, Dario Argento movies. Like I said, these three movies here I'm watching for the first time. They have this great, one of my favorite movies of the year is on there right now, Horror Noir. It is a uh, documentary on black horror, and after watching, just watching Us right, right around that time, it's something you have to take a deep dive into, and I absolutely love that documentary. It is a fantastic look at, at the subgenre of horror, and yeah, just check out Shudder, five bucks a month, it's worth your money. Anyway, the last movie that I did check out on Shudder this last week is the Tom Hanks classic, directed by Joe Dante. It is The Burbs. So yes, this is a first time watch for me. Um, a little bit of a cult classic movie. And f- for me, I hadn't heard about this movie until maybe a year ago. And I don't remember how I came across it, but you know, it's been on my shutter queue since I saw it on there. And you know, finally, I just want. I'm like, I just want to sit down. Kind of watch a, uh, it's it's definitely a, you know, horror comedy, if you want to call it that. And, you know, I just want to sit down and watch something fun. And you know what that, that movie right here, this movie is just fun. The Burbs. Tom Hanks, Bruce Dern kills it in this movie. I absolutely love Bruce Dern's character. And Tom Hanks is, is peak Tom, 80s Tom Hanks in this movie. Uh, coming off big right before this and... Uh, Joe Dante knows exactly what he's doing in this movie. It takes it takes a look at the the hysteria of suburban culture, you know, the fear of something new, something different. And the basic plot is Tom Hanks, he lives in, in suburban California, and he is becomes convinced that his new next door neighbors are a satanic cult or murderers or something bad is going on next door and he becomes convinced by his other neighbor that they need to investigate and figure out what is wrong with all these people and his entire suburban neighborhood becomes convinced that this new family living down the street is a group of satanic cult murderers and it goes in hilarious fashion after that and joe dante delivers fun commentary on society and the suburban life and you know, for for us living in the Midwest, this is very, very uh, relative to us. We we understand where they're coming from with this because you know the Midwest is ba- basically just all suburban area, and I think Tom Hanks just delivers one of his funniest performances in this movie. And yeah, if you haven't checked out, checked out the Burbs, definitely definitely worth a watch. There's a a lot of fun commentary, and there is a lot of fun to be had with this movie. Not. Not one of the the uh, most known roles, I guess, for Tom Hanks, as far as you know the the mainstream audience. But I think it's definitely worth a watch. One of the standouts to me, and I don't know if I I heard this somewhere, but Corey Feldman is also in this movie. This is teenage Corey Feldman, and he just comes off as he is annoying every single person in this cast. You know, his character, I guess, is supposed to be a, a bit of annoying, but. I could just kind of, you could just kind of tell within their eyes, within the way they interact with him, that they are annoyed by Corey Feldman. So I wonder if that's true. If it is, I can see it happening. So yes, the Burbs definitely check it out. It is on Shutter right now. And the last bit of news I, I do want to talk about. It's not news, but uh, the last group of films that I watched this past week. Um, as I said, we just moved to a new studio, aka. I just moved into a new house for the first time, and while I'm doing that, you know, we're doing a lot of unpacking, that's why we didn't have an episode, because all the the uh, podcast equipment was packed up, so we, we were working on that, and as we were working on unloading stuff, you know, you always just gotta throw on a movie just for background noise, and uh, last weekend, I just threw on the Austin Powers trilogy, they're on Netflix right now, and I just watched, you know, International Man of Mystery, then The Spy Who Shagged Me, then Goldmember, just back to back to back, just... I've seen the movie a million times, owned all three on VHS back in the day, still own all three on DVD now, and I have to say, this is one of, if not the best comedy trilogies of all time, and maybe I'll get crap for it just because I I grew up on Austin Powers, but I legitimately think these are three of the funniest movies that have ever been made. Mike Myers understands this role, he plays it to perfection, and 
the, the new characters he brings to each movie, I think he just embodies them perfectly, as well as just bringing something new and funny to each movie. Um, you know, the first movie is just him playing the du- dual roles of Austin and Dr. Evil. The second movie, you had Fat Bastard. And then the, the third and final movie, unfortunately for right now, you add Goldmember. And, I don't know, for me, I think these movies, all three of them hold up. It's hard to pick a favorite of them all. You know, growing up, I watched, I think I watched Goldmember the most. Why? I don't know. But, I, I think all three hold up. I do think, probably, International Man of Mystery is the best one, the, the first film of the franchise. And, you know, Mike Myers, he needs to make a comeback. He's starting to show up a little bit more in different roles. He He's hosting the Gong Show. He was in Bohemian Rhapsody this last year, playing a very meta role, and um, I, I just want to see more from Mike Myers. You know, if we can get Bill and Ted's uh, third film in the franchise where they face the music, I want either an Austin Powers 4 where we finally get the, the little stinger tease at the end of Goldmember where Seth Green's... Um, uh, son, uh, Dr. Evil's son, Scotty, is now going to be the new villain. I think that's an interesting way to go. Maybe if you just do a Dr. Evil movie, he seems more interested in that character. He's shown up as Dr. Evil countless times on, uh, SNL and Fallon. Like, he's done that character more than he's done Austin Powers now. And I would love to see an Austin Powers 4 in some capacity from Mike Myers. And you know what? If if he's not going to do that, maybe we'll get the uh, the closing chapter of his trilogy for Wayne's World. Because, you know, I guess we got a, an Austin Powers trilogy. Let's get a Wayne's World trilogy. Let's finish it off. I do want to see... Wayne's World is... The, the original film is one of my top three favorite comedies of all time. That film, Dumb and Dumber, and Monty Python and the Holy Grail, always my top three right there. And Wayne's World is a movie I've I've watched a million times, and I think that's just a movie you can absolutely do today. Bring back Mike Myers, Dana Carvey, and let's make that movie happen. And I mean, it it honestly it, it kind of writes itself. You know, you had these two slacker dudes from the '90s. They were working on a cable access TV show, so why not make these two uh, podcasters? Right here, this is what I'm doing right now. Everybody has a podcast these days. And, you know, with that being said, if you have a podcast or if you listen to podcasts and you choose this one to listen to out of the millions of millions of podcasts, thank you for listening. But um, with that being said, I think that's the storyline you have to go with Wayne's World 3. Wayne and Garth are podcasters. They're trying to make it out in this world. And maybe they come across, you know, the the dreaded YouTube ads or something like that. You know, this this is a movie that absolutely can absolutely can work in today's context. So, I think you, you Mike Myers, please make one of those two movies. I don't care which one. I would just absolutely love to see either one of those movies eventually show up. You know, in the in a theater near me. I never watched either of those uh, series in the in the theater. So. Heck, I would probably cry like I cried watching Star Wars or Halloween for the first time in the theater. So, Mike Myers, please make it happen just so I can cry in the theater during one of your movies. And that is not uh, the love guru. Anyway, um, that's, yeah, that's kind of what I've been watching uh, recently. Just kind of rambling off some of the movies I've seen. So, if you've seen any of those movies, Hellraiser 3, Chud, The Burbs, the Austin Powers trilogy, let me know which ones uh, you've watched, which ones are some of your favorites. Uh, which ones of those you are going to check out after this. So, yeah, that's kind of what I what I had for this episode here. Um, I want to plug some stuff that we got going on with Backlot 605. Um, we have some really cool stuff here coming up, guys, and I'm excited to finally bring it to you. Uh, me and Brian have been working really hard to bring together a, an entirely new team to the uh, Backlot 605 group, and we're excited to... Uh, well, I guess next week we are going to announce, um, well, I guess not next week. In, in two weeks, we're going to be doing an episode with, with one of our new members. He has been on the show before. Um, we'll just leave it at that. So, um, Anyway, we got to plug some of the stuff we got going on at Backlot 605. Uh, we do have a new review from John Wick Chapter 3 Parabellum, a review written by Andy Erickson, one of our contributing writers. 
And yeah, check out this awesome review. Andy is doing great stuff. Thank you so much for writing for us, Andy. He checks out movies all the time, every week. So um, be on the lookout for new release reviews coming from Andy pretty much every week. So thank you for that, Andy. And check out his review right now on Backlot605.com for John Wick 3. Um, we also have to announce that we do have another episode of our new podcast, Anime Anatomy, hosted by Kayla and Logan. Every single week, every Saturday, they're going to be releasing a new review of an anime series, movie, whatever it may be. The first episode they did was on the, um, the first episode they did was on one of the most popular television animes out there right now, Fairy Tale. They discussed the first dozen episodes of that very long, uh, ongoing show, and they discussed that, but... Their second episode, they did a review of the G-Kids movie MFKZ, also known as Motherfuckers in other other countries. Um, so check out that review right now on Backlot605.com. It's up there. Also check out their podcast feed on YouTube, uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher. I believe it is on Google Play now. I'm not sure. We'll have to double check on that, but yeah, it, it's pretty much wherever you can find the Backlot 605 podcast, you can find the Anime Anatomy one on there as well. Please check that out if you know any friends that love anime. You know, I'm not an anime guy, but you know what? If, if you have friends that love anime, please send them to this because we would love to have new viewers, and that's the whole point of their show. Just like ours, we want to introduce people to some movies, you know, maybe they hadn't heard of before, and that's what they want to do there. And talk about some of their favorite animes over on Anime Anatomy. Um, we also have a very, very, very cool interview coming out here on Backlot 605. We had the chance to do a Q&A with screenwriter Zach Stentz. He is most known for his work on X-Men First Class, Thor, the original film, and uh, a guilty pleasure of mine from my childhood, Agent Cody Banks, starring Frankie Muniz. But yeah, he is a screenwriter for all those movies, X-Men First Class, Thor, Agent Cody Banks. And yeah, we just did a Q&A with him uh, over on Backlot605.com for his new movie coming to Netflix, Rim of the World, about a group of teens who are at a summer camp who come, who uh, become part of a alien invasion. So this movie is directed by Mick G, and Stentz has penned the script from an original screenplay that he, uh, an original concept that he came up with. So please check our, uh, out our Q&A with him right now on Backlot605.com. This is a very cool get for us. We are so excited to have Zach uh, do this for us. And, you know, hopefully we can do some more stuff with him, maybe get him on the podcast. That would be a lot of fun because X-Men First Class is my favorite X-Men movie, and I just love to pick his brain about that movie. So, yeah, check out that Q&A right now on Backlot605.com. Also, please check out our buddy Andy at Fat Dude Digs Flicks. Uh, he's doing some awesome movie reviews. He is on the radio every week on Keller Radio here in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Check that out every single Friday. And Andy he is an awesome dude. We will have him on the show eventually at some point. Uh, we are working on a big Halloween-themed episode for this October with Andy. So be on the to be on the uh, lookout for that coming out uh, this October. Uh, if you're on social media, please also check us out on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. While you're on those, use hashtag schmuck club because that's all we are. I've just been a schmuck rambling here for about 45 minutes. Uh, if you're on Twitter, um, yeah, use that hashtag. If you're on Facebook, though, please check out the Sioux Falls Film Community Group. You can find that on our Facebook page just under our groups. And, yeah, that's where you can join the conversation. We're having some awesome stuff on there, so please check that out. If you're from the Sioux Falls or South Dakota area, Join that. We talk a lot of movies, not a lot of uh, new releases, casting news, all that fun stuff right there on that group page. Also, please check out us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, YouTube. That's where you can find this podcast if you have any of those. Um, yeah, uh, please subscribe to all those while you're on them. Uh, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's where we can get uh, a lot of exposure by having people subscribe. Also, if you're on social media or on those uh podcast channels please just share this to all your friends who who love movies or are just getting into movies please share it to them and let them explore the world of film through backlot 605 that would be an awesome thing for you guys to do and, and we'd much appreciate it also check out backlot 605.com that's where our main hub is you can check out our latest movie news reviews articles discussions we have a lot of cool stuff coming out um, new new release reviews every single week 
Um, I've talked about the John Wick review. Next week we're gonna have we're gonna have a pretty big week for new releases. Um, we're gonna be talking about Aladdin. We're gonna be talking about Brightburn, Booksmart, and Rim of the World. We've got a lot of new releases we're gonna be talking about, so please check them out there. Um, I'm also working on a new article. I'll, uh, that should be dropping this week. It is the top five horror sequels that are better than the original. I'm sure it's going to spark some controversy within the uh, horror fans out there, but it's an article I've wanted to write for a while now, and I'm very excited to release. Also, while you're on our website, please check out the Tee Public Store. You can find all our merch on there, buy a cool sticker, a pillow, a t-shirt, why not? Uh, anything you do on there helps support the podcast, and uh, we also have the Anime Anatomy stuff is on the podcast, uh, or on the Tee Public Store and that is available right now. I just bought some awesome stickers for that, so we will uh, be sticking those on our water bottles, on our cars, wherever you want to do with those. So that'll be uh, yeah up on the T Public Store right now. And with that being said, I think I covered everything we wanted to, to plug, as we always do. And uh, well, thank you guys for listening. This has been episode 28 of the Backlot 605 podcast. We will return next week. With our uh, usual crew, Brian will be here, and uh, Chris will be on as well next week. In honor of Rocket Man, starring Taron Edgerton about the Elton John. Uh, it is the Elton John biopic. We are going to be talking about musicians that are in need of a biopic. So we're going to be talking about that coming up. Uh, so yeah, it gives you guys some time to think about, you know, what are some musicians you guys think that need a biopic out there. I have a few on my mind, but yeah, we're each going to bring three to the table, and uh, yeah, that'll be next week. I'm excited to talk about that one. But until next time, you've been listening to Backlot 605, and we'll see you on the Backlot of South Dakota.